everybody, welcome. <laughs> welcome to uh, uh, our workshop here, and you are all brave because, first of all, it's in the middle of lunch or after lunch, and so everybody is starting to get like the post-lunch uh, tiredness, and I will throw something at you if I see anybody dozing off. Uh, secondly, you're brave because we are talking about kids' ministry. Uh, it is not for the faint of heart. Also, so welcome to everybody here in the room and also online. Um, I'm Pastor Scott. I am the kids pastor here at our Richland campus. And uh, we are talking today about building a kids ministry around his presence. Um, and I'm going to share for a little while. And then uh, my awesome team with me, we're going to come up and do a little bit of Q&A. So if you have a question, talk it, uh, talk it away, write it down, and uh, we'll get to that. Uh, but really, kids' ministry is uh, not for the faint of heart. I remember we have a parking team, and just in the dead of winter, it was like February, and they're all bundled up in their jackets and their hats and, and gloves, and uh, I, I walk past them as they were going out, and I'm like, thank you. You guys, you're the, you guys are so brave, like, out there. And they turned around to me, and they're like, no, you are the brave ones, like, letting us drop off our kids. Uh, and they, you know, this, this man with this beautiful gray, full beard, he, he was like, he would crumble in a room full of children. And so I think a lot of you know what I'm talking about. Um, how many of us here are involved in kids' ministry in, in one way or another? Pretty much all of us. Well, thank you so much for doing that. And uh, it's a real honor for me to be able to share with you. So, uh, again, my name is Scott. My wife uh, is Sam. She's hanging out in the back. Uh, we moved from Rochester, New York uh, to here about nine months ago. So in the middle of uh, the pandemic in August, um, we felt a call to, to come out here. And uh, it's been amazing ever since. Obviously, this last year um, has been wild. You know, nothing is the same. Uh, but for me, kids' ministry has been a new journey. I had not been in a, you know, more of a, a pastoral or a, a positional role with kids' ministry uh, before coming here. Uh, but it opened up, and I have um, just a just a love for kids and seeing the, the spark in their eye and seeing the no filter when you ask a question, they say exactly what they're thinking. Uh, and so um, it has been an awesome, awesome journey. So um, first of all, we're not talking about COVID. Can I, can I get an amen? Like we're, everybody's sick of talking about COVID and you all know all the procedures and policies and stuff to, to make your environment safe, hopefully. That's not what this is going to be. I'm, I'm so done talking about COVID. Uh, but we are uh, talking about uh, something else. And uh, really, if we could get the slide up, if we're able to, uh, we're going to start off with a problem that I think a lot of us have heard this statistic, um, that 64% of young people are leaving the church after being active members as kids and teens. Uh, this was a uh, statistic uh, put up by the Barna Group uh, recently. And it's something that has sh sent us shockwaves everywhere, and, and uh, it's caused a lot of thought and reflection about what is going on with this, with this crisis and this problem. And so could it be that, you know, before COVID, there were plenty of, of uh, plans and, and programs and um, different things we do to keep ourselves busy, but um, this statistic makes me pause and think, why? Why are we doing this? Because programs and all these things are good, but they need to be uh, led by uh, a move of the Spirit. They need to be led by an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to ask, could it be that kids have uh, grown fat with programs and, and uh, events, but are starved for a, a, an encounter with the Holy Spirit? And I know it's kind of provocative to say that, but it's, it's kept me up at night, and it's something I want to explore with you all. See, I think what we need is a spirit-inspired ministry that, that everything else flows from. And so we need, of course, discipleship in one hand, spiritual mothers and fathers who are teaching the word, who are um, uh, modeling the word, discipling. But it, we also need an encounter with the living God. The spirit uh, should speak, and we will follow. Uh, and I think also the choices we make in kids' ministry directly impact where our church is going in 10, 20, and 30 years. 
So for me, I, I'm not the most qualified person to be sharing with you today. I don't have uh, the most experience or the most impressive degree or anything like that. But what I want to do is just share from our heart really a testimony of what's been going on in our kids' ministry over the last year or so and, uh, and give you kind of uh, just, I don't know, some encouragement today, hopefully, because it's, uh, it cannot... Um, it can be difficult sometimes. And so what I want to do is share some, some wins and some things that we've been learning. And uh, if we have time, maybe hear some stuff that's going on in all, your all churches as well. So what we're going to do is talk about three pillars uh, for building a kid's ministry around his presence. And so if we think about actually what kids need is an encounter with the living God, maybe you can get in, in the habit of, of going to programs, but when the r- real world hits them, and I thought Pastor Lee's message today was powerful and potent for this, talking about when pressure is, is introduced to a zero-gravity atmosphere, uh, things can crumble away if it's not rooted in something deeper. And so how can we create environments where kids can encounter uh, the spirit of the living God uh, to be able to move on into adulthood with a strong faith and with conviction. So I've recognized these three things that have popped up in our ministry, and I've kind of explored them, and it's cool because I've seen parallels uh, with uh, the book of Acts, and not, not as a model, but more as a, um, as a, a goal or a... Um, honestly, kind of like a paradigm of, hey, I see this happening in, in the scriptures, and I see it happening with our kids' ministry. Uh, let's explore this idea a little bit more. So uh, these three words we're going to explore, which are uh, expectation, alignment, and opportunity. These three words, I think, uh, for us have formed the pillar of, of building a kid's ministry around his presence. So we're going to explore them. Uh, each is going to have a little tag and a little axiom with it. And then we'll talk about um, some practical stuff that we've been doing and then open it up for some Q&A. So first of all, expectation. And the little tag with it is there is no junior Holy Spirit. I know it can be a little bit of a cliche sometimes, we talk about it and we hear it, but when you stop and think about it, there is no junior Holy Spirit. And so when I mean expectation, um, I see it in the book of Acts uh, when uh, Jesus uh, has died, but he's also uh, uh, risen and he's ascended. But first he says, wait for the promise of the Father, uh, wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. So there's, a, there's an expectation that they're waiting for. And so also reading from the, the prophet Joel, Peter gets up, and I just want to read this. After the Spirit comes and he's explained to everybody, uh, there's an expectation that they've been waiting for, and he links it together. And so this is in uh, Acts 2. Uh, Peter says, In the last days it shall be that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and uh, your adults shall prophesy, and uh, your parents shall see visions. Wait a minute. Oh, no. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. So there's an expectation that, whoa, there is no junior Holy Spirit. Uh, children are going to prophesy and see visions. So there is an expectation that happens when the Spirit hits, fills them uh, at Pentecost, that it's not just the adults who are having flames of fire. I believe it was families who were encountering the presence of God and being touched, uh, filled with the power to actually go out and fulfill the Great Commission. And so that's, that's what I see in the book of Acts. And so here's the axiom with it. This is why uh, expe- expectation is so important. Setting an expectation of encounter with the Holy Spirit for our team and our kids is important because it heightens our ability to notice the Spirit working in and around us. Sometimes on a Sunday morning, it can be like a whirlwind. Like, this volunteer doesn't show up, and, you know, these families are coming in, and there's not time. I'm putting out fires everywhere. But that word notice is key there. Because if we believe that the Spirit uh, gives grace to the church and works in the church apart from everything that we do, He is working all around us, and we just need to slow down to notice it. But having that key word, expectation, Helps. So first of all, we uh, have been giving expectation to our volunteers. Um, what, one of the cool things we do is a half hour before the service, we have a group huddle with our, our kids team. And uh, we usually give announcements, uh, but then we also spend time uh, in prayer, just kind of dedicating the service to the Lord. 
And that half hour chunk, it's, it's about like a 10 minute or less connect. But that, if you are uh, a leader and you have the power to maybe introduce something like that, or maybe you're doing something like that already, is one of the key ways to introduce expectation in your team. Because uh, what we've been doing is uh, it's a chance to say, hey, here's what they're talking about in the main service today. Here's, you know, they're talking about the Holy Spirit or they're, they're talking about um, you know, whatever it is, it links them together with what's going on in the main service. It doesn't make them feel like I'm sacrificing here and I'm totally missing out on what the church is doing. No, what the, we're what doing in the kids' ministry is actually a main function of what the church is doing. So it's a chance to, to connect them with the main service. It's also a time to share testimonies uh, from our volunteers and their families and encourage them, hey, reach out to me if, if you've been praying for something, contending for something. Uh, we'll partner with you in that, and uh, we, we're just going to share it at our uh, little debrief before the service. And so there have been volunteers who have, who have gotten sick with COVID, who have... Um, you know, their, their kids, there's, you know, family crisis, all sorts of things. And we can bring that to our huddle and say, hey, we're going to lift them up in prayer. Or we're going to celebrate somebody was miraculously healed or somebody, uh, you know, found a job or a prayer was answered. That energizes people and it helps them notice where the spirit might be working. And it's also helpful to remind your team. Um, I say phrases like, um, when I'm praying, I can just say, you know, Lord, give us ears to hear what you're speaking. Or I can remind everybody, you know, um, Lord, thank you that you have anointed us to be here at this moment. Uh, pray that you would bless every family that steps through these doors. Saying these phrases like this in this prayer, it helps people think, you know, where am, instead of, you know, where am I going to lunch after church? You can be like, oh, I'm, I'm anointed. Like, what does that even mean? Like, this Holy Spirit is here. Uh, the, the service is dedicated. And it helps them go out to their classrooms noticing and ready to encounter the Holy Spirit um, with their kids. And uh, never, never let me hear you. I don't think any of you would or your volunteers ever call children's ministry child care. It's like, <laughs> it's definitely not child care. Uh, that's something that happens and it's important and it's good, but it's uh, the furthest from the, uh, the truth uh, of what happens uh, with us on our weekend services. Um, and so it's those things that you help people just shift one little degree changes everything. And it brings um, that first... Um, expectation to them. And then with our kids, um, when I am teaching, I, I usually teach about once a week in, in our elementary room. And by the way, this is one of our elementary rooms. Uh, currently shut down. It's, it's going to open up soon, but you can see it's been a little bit untouched. It's like COVID broke out and we sealed this room and haven't thought about it uh, since, uh, <laughs> since we've reopened. So these flags and stuff, it's, it's a result of one of, those, uh, one of those program things that we're trying to... Uh, control. So, um, but anyways, this is our space. This is our, uh, this is our domain. So I'm glad you guys can, uh, can join us here. But uh, what I do with, with kids is uh, talking uh, about the Holy Spirit just as a person, uh, normalizing it, speaking uh, to them in, in plain language. Um, it's not just something that can happen, you know, the Holy Spirit speaking to them. It's something that uh, he promises will happen. And um, it's something that God desperately wants to do to them. So just to even when you're going into a prayer time or when you're, when you're uh, you know, doing a ministry time, to talk about the Holy Spirit and also sharing personal stories. Hey, you know, last week I was praying and I felt the Holy Spirit say this. You know, tell them, tell it to these kids and say, you know, he, he can do this for you too. Or uh, even I love to remind them of stories in the Bible of God speaking and calling people at a young age. I know uh, Samuel is one of the classic examples. Uh, as a child in the temple and hearing God call him, um, saying, you know, Samuel was just a kid. He was probably, you know, a, a 10, 11, 12. He can do that for you too. And to bring that expectation for kids to start thinking, okay, what am I feeling? What am I maybe hearing in a time of prayer or during a lesson or something like that? There's no junior Holy Spirit, and um, that's, that's something we live by. So secondly, we're going to talk about alignment. And alignment means uh, being tethered to the mission of my local church. I know for you know, kids' ministries I've seen sometimes, um, it can feel like floating, um, uh, kind of a, a 
something that we do that's not really attached to the mission of the church, but it's kind of something that there's an expectation, and they're doing their own thing. They have their own name, own curriculum, but there's not quite a lot of overlap, maybe a different vision statement or different values or things like that. And what we've found is aligning with where the church is going has been one of the uh, most impactful ways to actually um, experience and, and host the presence of God with us. And let me, let me explain that. Um, aligning with the mission and vision of your local church, um, here's our, our axiom, um, is vital because it creates clarity and brings you under the direction and covering of the senior pastor or your church governance. And so uh, it, it brings clarity with, with what you're doing, where you're going, even asking yourself, why are we doing this? It brings clarity um, and also brings you under the covering to say, hey, we're at this church because we believe in, in the mission where we're going. And so we're not just, you know, picking some random curriculum and doing our own thing. We agree and we believe that uh, the kids and the youth are actually the future of the mission and vision we're talking about. Um, and so for us... Um, the, oh, you know what? Let me jump back to Acts just so we can stay on track here. So I see alignment, and uh, it's great because the disciples get it wrong at first. Jesus comes to them. He's resurrected, and they say, oh, is now the time you're going to restore Jerusalem? Now, finally, you're going to pick up the sword and liberate us from Rome. Uh, and Jesus is like, no, you, you know, you do not know what's going on. But then it clicks at Pentecost, and what happens um, the, they stand up and they remember Jesus came, he, he was preaching repentance, he was introducing the kingdom of God. And so Peter stands up and he uh, preaches the gospel and thousands were saved and baptized. So they were, didn't quite understand it, but when they stepped into alignment with it, the Holy Spirit broke out and the church uh, exploded. And so that has been um, maybe not quite that dramatic, but we've decided to do something similar in our kids' ministry. We had um, an off-site meeting, maybe five, six months ago to get away our kids ministry and say, okay, what is, what's God doing? What's the Holy Spirit doing? And just getting clarity. And we felt to that shift to say, okay, uh, we need to uh, shift our kids. Val I think we had some kids values that were good, but they were, they weren't part of our DNA. I think we had gotten them from a, a church resource website or something, and they were fine because we go over our kids' values every week um, in our classrooms. But we felt the need to say, actually, no, let's pivot this and come into alignment with where we're at as Radiant. Um, if you could put up that slide, and I, I had to put these up here just to, to show you, uh, and then one more. And we have five core values uh, at Radiant Church, and they are... Um, Let's see, go forward a little bit. We'll put them up there. But our five core values are uh, being word-centered, spirit-empowered, family-oriented, kingdom-focused, and mission-motivated. So, and so those are, those are powerful. Those are our directives. So what we did is we were thinking, okay, how can we put this in a way that kids will understand it and it'll invite space for more conversation? And so what we've done is, uh, you, I think you can actually see banners outside in the hallway and in some of our open classrooms. Uh, we uh, decided to launch these new values um, and they get at what we're trying to do. Uh, so first of all, we have the Bible is true. The Holy Spirit lives in us. We are children of God. Jesus is king, and we share the gospel. So these five core values for kids' ministry have been uh, transformative, honestly, because we go through them before every single lesson, and the kids picking up on them so much, and it gives us an opportunity to talk about each one of these. You know, the Bible, it's witness, what it talks about, uh, the, what creation and, and redemption and what's wrong and where we're going. That is a true witness. It's something we can base our lives on. Um, and the Holy Spirit lives in us. When we actually ask him, he promises to fill us with power, to be able to live a holy life, to tell people about him. So it just opens up so much conversation. Um, and it also, um, I mean, you can see where you could take each one of these. And so we built a kind of a mini curriculum out of them, and, and they're going to set the course for us going forward to say, okay, here's an option or an I idea. You know, one of us has an idea in a brainstorming session, and we can think, okay, does it fit in line with these values? If yes, bring it on. If no, we probably toss it aside because we're, we're focused and it's in line where, uh, with where Radiant is going. They play into one another, and uh, we're going we're gonna to see that in a little bit. But um, 
here's something I was thinking about is the mission of the church is really the, the mission of the generational ministry of, of kids and of youth um, because the generational ministry is responsible for shaping the ones who are going to fulfill the mission of the church. Why contend for revival if we don't take the time to raise up dynamic disciples who can steward what God has done? And so we are a praying and a worshiping church, um, but if we don't take time to invest in the kids who are actually being raised up, uh, I don't know if God would move in a way if we're not uh, prepared to steward what he's giving us. And so that's why we do it. When you step into alignment, you feel a clarity and you feel like you can step into the flow of what the church is doing rather than just, oh, you know, we're floating out here, we're, we're doing great, it's fine, but it's not quite as dynamic. So uh, stepping into alignment has transformed what we're doing. Uh, and then finally, uh, opportunity. Making space for the spirit. So if you have, um, you have alignment and then you have expectation, uh, those are great, but they are um, almost useless, if I can say that, um, if you don't make opportunity. Um, an opportunity for the, the spirit to actually uh, touch these kids and transform their lives. So in the book of Acts, the, the 120 who were waiting there praying until the day of Pentecost, uh, after Jesus ascended, they didn't go around yet making themselves busy with activities. We got we to gotta go, we got to go. They, they waited and they prayed and they made opportunity uh, for God to move. They said, we're waiting for the promise of the Father. We're giving plenty of opportunity. Uh, and then when the Holy Spirit did come, uh, they were going out to the temple. They were sharing things in common. They were creating uh, with the Spirit. They were creating all sorts of opportunity to move through the Spirit. So people were getting healed. People were being provided for. Uh, people who have no homes now are, uh, are having, being clothed and being fed. And, and so that all is a function of the Holy Spirit. But it's because uh, they made space uh, for opportunity for the spirit to move. So I have powerful memories um, in kids' church of the Holy Spirit um, speaking to me or touching me, you know, getting baptized in the Holy Spirit, um, you know, getting impacted by somebody's message. And, and a lot of you probably do too. And so this is, here, here's the axiom with it for opportunity. Um, having expectation alignment are great, but if you don't have opportunity, um, it, it's not, uh, it won't do you much good. But creating opportunity for encounter with the Holy Spirit is so important because it's where the real transformation takes place. Everything can change in a moment with the Spirit. It's where real transformation takes place. And again, I, I think Pastor Lee stole my notes, honestly, when he's talking about one moment with the Spirit. And I said, yes, the pe people are going to be ready uh, for this session. So how do we do this? Um, so making room uh, during your weekend services. So you have all sorts of families come in, and some kids have been churched. They have some of that uh, biblical framework, some not at all. So um, you can do things, though, that still uh, welcome, no matter where kids are at. Um, so I love to give opportunities to, to respond um, when we're talking about anything. So uh, you, can, you can incorporate it with anything you're talking about. If you're talking about patience, you know, kindness, courage, you know, boldness, anything in your kid's curriculum, uh, at the end of the service, you can allow them to respond and explain that the Holy Spirit uh, actually is the one who gives us these things. We're not just talking about, you know, being, uh, being kind to your neighbor, but we're actually going to say, okay, who wants to be kinder? Who wants help to be kinder? And I always say, you know, I do. And we don't have to just make ourselves work harder to, to do these things. The Holy Spirit because he lives in us, value number two, uh, he promises that he's going to give us power to do these things. It's not just about rules to make yourself a better person, but God himself uh, enables us to do this. And so, you know, let's respond. Who wants more of this? And when kids say, yes, I want it, the Holy Spirit says, okay, I'll, I'll give it to you. Um, and uh, again, there's no junior Holy Spirit. Um, but also, I, I'm a huge fan of simple prayers, too. Uh, you don't need to make it weird. <laughs> don't make it weird. I highlighted that in my notes. Um, I love repeat-after-me prayers. It keeps them engaged, and it, it teaches them to pray. It, it kind of demystifies it. So, you know, if kids are saying, you know, we're talking about patience. I want more patience. And, you know, ask the kids to raise their hands and say, you know, dear Jesus, have them repeat after you. You know, Holy Spirit, fill me. Give me patience. When you, when you say these powerful words like this, um, it's, it gives me shivers. When I'm hearing a, a group of you know, 25, 30 kids say, oh, Holy Spirit, fill me up. And it's not, 
manufactured, but it's kids saying, I want more of you. And then here's what I'm experimenting with lately. I, I, I'll, I'll say a prayer, and then I'll say, okay, we're going to take, fi- you know, maybe 10, 15 seconds, and after our prayer, we're just going to be quiet and tell the Holy Spirit in your heart, you know, I, I'm open. Um, would you please speak to me and uh, hear what he says? And if you think, Scott, you're crazy. Like, I, I know elementary kids. I tell you, I've had, t- you know, 20, 25 kindergarten through second graders dead silent for like 15 seconds. <laughs> and uh, it was powerful. We were talking about, um, uh, t- uh, talking about our, our, uh, our vocation. I think we were talking about the Great Commission, how each of us is called to fulfill the Great Commission, and he, he calls us to do different things uh, no matter what we do. And I said, okay, we're going to be quiet for about 15 seconds and ask the Holy Spirit, you know, Holy Spirit, where do you want me to go? And uh, one kid was like, you know, I heard, he's in first grade, I heard I'm supposed to be an engineer, or, I, you know, one kid is like, I heard I'm supposed to be a missionary. Um, and these things that are like, I got to write this down. Like, I'm not, I'm not giving leading questions. I'm not, uh, you know, really, okay, some of you are going to hear this. You're going to hear. But I'm just leaving it open for them to hear. And to set that space for encounter is, is huge. Um, and so I would invite you to, to just try it. Just try it. That's the cool thing about kids ministry is that that's not, you know, live streamed. There's not, you know, thousands of people <laughs> who are going to be, who, who are going to be, you know, uh, replaying, uh, you know, some, if you fumble over something or if it goes terribly wrong. Uh, but what the Holy Spirit will honor is a, a commitment to making space for him to actually speak to people. And so, uh, here we go. We're going to be tying it all together with just a few testimonies of what, uh, what we've tried. So um, if you will go to a Radiant Church, uh, even in the network, has anybody else done Seek services or something similar to it? So uh, we do a season of Seek. It's in January and in September, and it's uh, really impactful for the church. We have uh, you know, speakers come in and, and just it prayer and fasting. And uh, every Wednesday night, we have a really big service. And along with the adult service, of course, we have you know, full kids ministry, uh, which is uh, just wild sometimes because they get dropped off right around the time. They're usually going to bed. And uh, we get to hang out with them well, and, and monitor all that. And uh, it's, been, it's been fun. But this last seek service in January, we said, okay, let's, let's go for it with kids' ministry. So right now we, we typically do video worship, you know, with hand motions and things. But let's, we said, let's grab the RSW students and uh, make them do live worship <laughs> for the kids. Uh, and we're going to make it like a camp experience. So we're going to have like a, a host. We're going to have like a guest speaker. We're going to do games. But we're going to go for it with our topics. And so we, we talked about... Man, what did we talk about? Like uh, being a disciple, uh, uh, repentance, uh, being like living on mission, salvation, baptism in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we saw some incredible, incredible things. So first of all, one of our volunteers came in on Wednesday night. She's like, my shoulder is killing me. I, I can't even raise my arm. Uh, she almost didn't even come in to serve. Uh, but when we stepped in, we, we all went in our, or for elementary, we all went to the youth room, just a bigger space. And as soon as worship started, her, her arm pain totally went away. Like, she, she literally got healed. And she's like, I heard about it the next day. She's like, yeah, my arm got healed completely. Um, and we got to tell the kids about it. Like, hey, the, you know, the Lord moves when we're worshiping him. Like, he can touch you and he can heal you. Another girl, we were, it was the last night, we're praying, talking about friendship with the Holy Spirit. And uh, we went home and, you know, we had worship and just an invitation for the kids to just le- invite the Holy Spirit to live inside of them. And on her way home, she's like, Mom, uh, I just felt the Holy Spirit pouring over me tonight. And we didn't say anything about, you know, being the Holy Spirit pouring, any, any kind of language like that. But it was an experience a kid had uh, with the living God, with the Holy Spirit, and it marked her. That is why we do what we do. Like, that's what, that's what gets us going. And, um, and there were all sorts of kids who, who were marked. I had parents coming to me, hey, I don't know what you did, but I'm seeing a change in my kids. Um, and, and what's going on? You know, they're, they're just riveted with us uh, challenging the kids and raising the expectation, making that alignment, and, uh, and also making room for the Holy Spirit to move. 
um, also our baptism services. So this was literally last weekend. Uh, one of the coolest things we can do is uh, live stream our services right on our TVs here. Because, um, you know, just pull up the live stream on, on your projection computer or whatever, and you can put it um, in your classroom. So um, it was baptism weekend, and a lot of parents were like, hey, can I pull out my kid? I want them to see baptisms. Um, but So what we did was just like, hey, let's let's just put the baptisms on the screen and it'll give us a chance to, to talk about it and, uh, and see what happens. So the kids were watching it and they saw some of their friends getting baptized. They saw whole families getting baptized and we got to say, um, talk about baptism, what it means, what it is, and uh, even say, is anybody feeling just the Holy Spirit maybe tug on your heart or, or just feeling like, hey, I want that, I want to do that. And we had over 25 kids uh, come and say, I want to get baptized. And, and I was blown away. And I'm like, is this hype or something? So I was with the clipboard, and I, I didn't want to be too cynical, but I'm like, I looked each kid in the eye, and I was like, do you want to get baptized? <laughs> okay. And they, they said yes, and so I write down their name. And the next one, do you want to get baptized? And <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm just trying to figure it out. So when I go to my campus pastor, they're going to be like, well, they're, no. And it was a great response, honestly. But each kid were like, you know, yes, I want to get baptized. They were serious about it. So next baptism is coming up in July. It might be half kids, and I'm going to be up there dunking them and probably weeping. So um, that was really, really cool for us to, to have all of these, these pillars of host and God's presence come, come together and, and just try it. Um, just a couple more. We've got, um, what else did we put up there? Oh, our radiant kids' values. So, you know, we talked about that with, uh, you know, word-centered, the Bible is true. And it's cool because they, they inform one another. I was going to try to put these in a, almost in a circle because uh, they go, um, they, are we able to, okay, are we able to put those five values up there? Um, because th you're able to talk about them and, and how they all are interwoven and they tie together. So, you know, the Bible is true and the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, we, you know, God is our Father. We're a, we're a common family. We're all children of God. And because we're children of God, he is our Savior, but he's also our Lord. There's a lordship aspect. He's our King. And because of this good news that Jesus died, rose again, and he's our King, uh, that's the gospel, and we share it. And we share it because uh, the witness of what happened with Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection, is in Scripture. And so it's, you can talk about the whole grand biblical narrative um, in this small uh, small tool, and that's where we had expectation. I mean, talking about the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. That is a heck of an expectation. And then you have alignment. Hey, this is where Radiant is going. And then you have opportunity to, to talk about it with our different values. And then finally, um, the one of the last things we were, ta were talking about is Kids Crew. Now, Kids Crew is our um, kids discipleship program, kind of where kids can... Um, uh, volunteer and help in younger kids' classrooms, but uh, this is where we're going. So this is just kind of raw because it's on our heart to uh, how can we feed kids who are hungry? They get it and they want more. And so uh, we have kids who are serving in younger classrooms, uh, but it's like how do we make space uh, for kids to maybe come, you know, once a month, uh, have a meal, play some games, and dive into some more teaching, dive into the Word, dive into discipleship, and hearing about their lives. Um, and that is uh, an opportunity, uh, again, for the Holy Spirit to, to come and, and fill these kids and, and just to be able to pour into them more. So that is, that's where we're going. Um, so kind of to wrap up, uh, a couple really helpful resources for us um, have been um, Faith for Exiles, it is a study by the Barna Group, again, by David Kinneman, and he uh, takes that statistic we talked about, and, and he said, okay, so among people who are not falling away, um, here are these five common distinctives that are common in kids um, who are raised in the church all the way up through high school and into college who come out of college with a really strong, resilient faith. And it's talking about... Uh, uh, discipleship and resilience in a digital Babylon. That's the idea. So that's been a huge uh, idea sparker for us. Um, and then also uh, the Spiritually Vibrant Home uh, by Don Everts. And he actually takes some of that data and plugs it into um, how do we apply this for families um, and uh, the power of, of bringing that discipleship piece into the home. Uh, and so those have been some of the things we're reading, some of the things we're thinking about lately uh, that uh, we just wanted to share with you. So um, as I'm going to wrap up, we're going to 
invite um, Danielle and, and Terry on out for some questions, but um, I just wanted to um, say, you know, it goes back to with these three pillars, um, we got to ask why. Why are we doing kids ministry? Is it just because it's what we've always done and there's expectation there and, uh, you know, it's my job or, you know, I'm, I, I enjoy it. It's great. You know, those, some of those things are fine. But I want to, to challenge you that we need to lead from a place of encounter with the Holy Spirit and everything else uh, follows. So we'll wrap up with that. And uh, my team is going to come on up if you want to grab your stools and we can do some, some Q&A. So I know it's kind of maybe a lot of info, but um, I'm excited to dig in. Thank you. To, uh, to some questions. So, and so, uh, real quick, this is uh, Danielle. She's our uh, kids coordinator at our Portage campus. She is awesome. And uh, this is uh, Terry, Terry Evans. She, uh, yeah, she is uh, very inspiring to me. She has been on, uh, on staff uh, a lot longer than me. And so I, whenever I uh, have a question or totally lost, I'm like, Terry, Terry, like, help me. So she's our, our kids director. And um, man, when you talk about uh, having um, an in with families and connecting, uh, I just, just want to say that you have been a huge inspiration because people are getting to know me and they're, you know, like, oh, hey, cool, Pastor Scott. But when Terry's there, everybody's like, I just can chill out. Like, everything's fine. Uh, and, uh, and that impact and that voice with families is, uh, is incredible. Yeah. So, yeah, let's open it up. And uh, anybody have any questions? And on, online, I think they can possibly text in too. So, So the question is, how do we organize kids' ministry from kindergarten through fourth grade? Um, our ministry also runs kindergarten through fourth grade as well, but we break them down into age groups that are more appropriate for their connection pieces. So kindergarten through second grade, generally, um, they group well together. Um, kindergartners are just learning, um, but you have the second graders who are also um, have learn a lot more and they can be an example for the younger kids. So partnering them together helps them in a classroom. And then third and fourth graders, they can go deeper into more teaching. So just having a space for them where they can um, have an opportunity to not have to connect with a kindergartner, but be able to grow in um, different areas as well. So just partnering them into different groups like that has been beneficial for our classrooms. Um, also partnering teachers that feel that they're equipped to be able to connect with kindergartners or first graders. That's been a huge point for us. And we also have teachers who feel more equipped to go deeper with third and fourth graders. So just making sure that we're equipping the classrooms with the teachers that are gonna connect best with them and then separating them into age groups that connect best together, I would say, is how we generally do that. And I think there have been times when we've had kindergarten on its own. Was that pre-COVID we had kindergarten first and second, and then third and fourth. Yeah. <laughs> so fifth grade is incorporated into junior high, actually. So um, what we have is, uh, we have an incredible, incredible students team. Uh, and so at our Sunday 11 a.m. service, they have a junior high service that's uh, fifth through seventh grade. And um, it, it's modeled similar to more of a traditional service with, with worship and a message. Um, and so, yeah, we, uh, we typically uh, end at fourth grade, and then uh, fifth grade goes into junior high. So I can say during COVID, that has been a um, huge thing that we were digging into is how are we partnering with parents at home to disciple them? 
because it felt like before COVID, it fell on us as a ministry to be the ones that are discipling their kids. But when, when all this hit and they were in their homes, it was, it was a big eye-opening experience for them to say, who's discipling my kids? So we dug into that a little bit and we started creating online experiences for parents. Um, and we really took some of the, the um, online experiences that we were creating and focusing it on it being family. So I know even across the church, when we were doing morning prayer, noon prayer, evening prayer, like our entire church engaged in that. And so I think that was a huge window for us to be able to um, say, like, this is in your home. Like, this is your responsibility to come in. Like, we can partner with you. We can give you tools. We can give you resources online. So the curriculum that we were using provided resources for us. Um, we were putting them online. We were using social media platforms to try to get parents to use those resources. But I think really the biggest part was just that our entire church came alongside us for that. And so just inviting kids in the morning in worship and in prayer time and telling their, the kids like, and parents, like, grab your kids, bring them in for prayer. So I think that was just like a big window and a big opportunity for us to say, hey, we're now partnering with you. And like, these are the tools that you need. But it's going to be your responsibility now. And so I think like a lot of the families that have come back into um, re-engage in church services, they are, they're way, they're way more equipped. Parents are asking way more questions and they want to know like what's more, what's next. So I think that's kind of the next step for us too, is just looking at what's more and what's next and how, now that they feel equipped, how can we come alongside them and take them to that next level? Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, the question is uh, ideas and suggestions for how to uh, get more volunteers on your team. So um, I think we could all, we've been brainstorming hard, and that's kind of like one of our main uh, smart goals we've been working on. Because uh, for the first few months that we opened back up, it was in uh, October, and the, the, the rate of volunteers coming back was about equal with the rate of families coming back. But then about two or three months ago, families went, Pew! And our volunteers uh, pretty much stayed the same. And so uh, we have, it's been difficult because we've had to turn some families away at, you know, at the door to say, I'm sorry, you know, the classroom is full. You can bring them into the sanctuary, but we, we have to keep, you know, do these different standards, which is heartbreaking. Imagine, you know, getting your kids in the car, maybe your first time coming back to church in almost a year, getting them through the door and then being told no. Like that's, that's devastating. Um, and so we have been, well, really, through personal relationship is how I've seen it, uh, especially with, with Terry, b just being reaching out to people all through COVID. But then we um, try to do things to, uh, to show that we uh, care for people and appreciate. So we have a Saturday night service. Um, and so our, talking to our campus pastor, um, we were saying, you know, a lot of volunteers come right from work and they don't have a chance to eat. And so he said, you know, let's, um, we can allocate some part of our budget. Let's bring in sandwiches every night uh, to feed them. And so we can, you know, don't have to worry about it. You know, come, you can bring your family and we'll, we'll do dinner. I know our, our worship team has been doing that. And so I'm like, let's bring that into our kids team as well, just to let people feel cared for. Um, and then we do, man, I guess we, we've done um, with these different special events, we really try to uh, show that we care, especially um, through, you know, the, our Sikh services or maybe our Easter services or different special events. We uh, get, you know, maybe merch for everybody who, who helps out, you know, gift cards. We, um, you know, maybe if there's a speaker who's, who's sharing at a Sikh service, we buy their book and you know, give it to all of our volunteers and just try to be generous and say, um, we really, really appreciate you, and there's actually a dollar amount attached to that. Um, not as a, something transactional, but as saying, you know, this is, this, we can't do this without you. Partner with us. And I think vision uh, is a huge part of that, too. Just to say, hey, 
uh, kids are a vulnerable group of people who have been marginalized for a, a long, long time, uh, and they are uh, in danger of, um, you know, even New York Times, different people like that are coming out with articles talking about, uh, you know, potential health, <laughs> mental health crises with kids who have just grown up for maybe half their life or, or around there uh, being masked, being at home only. Um, so to be able to say, hey, we have a unique time in history where we can actually affect real change in families and to be able to bring uh, healing and hope to that, why don't you come and partner with us? And, and we would love to do that. And to, to be able to have that vision to say, we're going for it. And, and um, you know, building it around his presence too. It's not a show. It's not childcare. It's, we're just going for it. And, uh, and be a part of that is huge for us. Yeah. Just one piece I want to add to that. And um, it is part of the family connection. But the biggest thing is to ask. You don't know unless you ask. You can analyze somebody's situation. You can say they're too busy. They don't want to get involved. But you never know. It's usually the person who's the busiest that has time that they can make for discipling kids. So if it's on their heart and the Holy Spirit has spoke it to them, they may not have, they might be questioning that. Like, did I really hear that? Did I really feel that? Um, but if you don't ask, they're not going to necessarily just come out and be like, I want to be part of kids' ministry. So those family connections and just the ask, I think, are two big pieces, too. I wanted to add also, I'm not a big mic talker, <laughs> um, but putting that connection also on your current volunteers, having them pray about who they know that would be great in kids' ministry, and then having them make that connection is also super helpful. I think what one of the practicals from that um, is that as we've just been talking is is we don't want to burn out our current volunteers but uh, the I guess the language that we used is to put the pressure on families not on our volunteers and so if we have standards to say okay you know this room we can have you know x amount of kids and when it's full um, it's full and we have to communicate that and it's it's difficult but to be able to even that's a way to let parents know hey there's actually a need here because if there's no need and we just you know bring them on in you know shovel them in there is space uh, they're going to think, oh, look at that. Kids ministry is doing great. There's no need. But to be able to actually have people feel it and, and not put that on your volunteers where there's you're packing 60 kids into a room this size, but to say, no, we're going to actually give you margin and respect what you're doing, and we're going to actually put some of that pressure on the congregation. Um, we've seen a lot of parents actually say, you know, one guy, he's a, um, he's a, uh, a doctor over at Bronson, and, um, you know, he's not able to serve a lot, but he's actually, he, one of his kids wasn't able to get into a classroom. And so he was like, instead of just complaining, why don't I join the team and help? And so he actually came all the way through the process, and it's so cool. Uh, just like Terry said, uh, the people you least expect, you maybe say no for them, don't do that. Um, put the pressure maybe on the congregation instead of burning out your, your good and faithful volunteers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, uh, all staff, uh, you know, coming on, full background check. And we, we, do, we have one um, online course called Protect My Ministry. That's something that we re-up, is it every year or every other year? Every year. Okay, so it's all about sexual harassment, um, that, that whole thing that you're required to, to complete um, routinely. Uh, and then we actually go an extra step. Um, we have a separate kids team application. Apart from, you know, we, we, we call them Team Radiant, who everybody who serves, they go through our class. And, uh, but we actually have a separate application that requires them to list uh, three or four references. And so we send out reference checks, and we need to get those back. Uh, and those have been um, really good at, at certain times, not many, but uh, one or two have been uh, given us a red flag to say, well, you know what, um, you know, maybe we'll find a different place for you. So um, and there's, yeah, anybody like to add more in? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so um, yes. So, uh, for an elementary service, uh, typically uh, we come in, um, service starts, and we have about a 15-minute window uh, to have the kids check in, you know, families who are coming late. And so we've got, you know, game tables and different activities. Uh, and then we gather them up, and we go through, we typically do an intro game, something like that. 
Um, and then we go through our values as kind of like a rallying point. All the kids come up, and we have the values on the screen. And then we do offering, and that's been actually another cool part. Um, Pastor Lee was talking about um, our building a radiant city, and uh, in that initiative, we challenged the kids to do it as well. We gave out these treasure boxes and said, "Hey, we're gonna, um, we are doing something, and we're doing something that God is calling us to in this next season." And uh, the kids raised money for five weeks as we were talking about each of our five core values. And at the end, we had a big commitment night where it was, you know, fun and a cool lesson and stuff. But the kids raised, I mean, I think it was over $300 or something. And uh, for, yeah, I mean, kids, they were so excited. They had their treasure boxes. We gave them these little jewels they could stick on it. And it was so, so cool. And, and, and not to make it overly, uh, you know, uh, cheesy or anything like that, but to have that, they, they rallied and they jumped on it. So um, having offering, uh, and then we have our worship, you know, typically uh, two to three worship songs uh, and our Bible lesson. And then we uh, wrap up with uh, a couple um, typically group activities. Either uh, we work on our monthly memory verse. Uh, we do it. Um, we do them by month. We we typically use orange curriculum uh, for our, our pre-K and elementary. And um, you know, no curriculum is perfect, and not like we're in love with it or anything. But it has you pick out the gold from it. Um, and um, so then we, we wrap up with a, a couple activities or crafts that, that is kind of application for the lesson. And then uh, kind of for the end, there's, um, you know, free, you know, play tables or craft tables or things while parents come and pick up. Yeah. Yep. So I just want to cover a little bit what it looks like for our um, early childhood area. We follow the same schedule that the elementary classrooms do as well as far as our teaching space but we actually use our classrooms as activity rooms. So they come in and they have open playtime, and then um, about 10 minutes into the service, we actually go down to what we call the praise place, and it is just a devoted space that has zero toys. They start their time off with an activity that they do together, so it's fun for them to go down there. They're super excited to go down there, um, but we follow the same schedule. They do um, values, they do um, worship, they do their offering, their, their entire lesson time, and then we break into small groups and do um, prayer time with the kids. And I think it's, a, it's been huge for us to be able to have a distraction-free space for them to go to. Um, and it does open up an opportunity for them to um, pray with the kids that are their peers and with adults as well. We use our kids crew to also lead those groups. So um, having them discipled so that they're comfortable leading other Little kids in prayer has been beneficial, but just them sharing prayer requests. Um, I had an, an, an encounter with some kids. We were sitting in a group, and I was leading prayer with them. And it was a group of three, four, and five-year-olds. And the one little one had a prayer request and said that his dad was in, in jail. And I, it broke my heart to think that, one, he was, his dad was in jail. But it also was very um, enlightening to me that he was comfortable to share that his dad was in jail and that he needed prayer for that. But then the thing that was the most powerful for me was the little girl that was sitting beside him said, so's my dad. And so there was just a piece that like the Lord opened up for them. And so I think just like expectation and encounter, if they're three, four, five, they still have the Holy Spirit. There is no junior Holy Spirit. So create those spaces, just see what works for, for your church. But yeah, it was pretty impactful for me. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> goldfish. We use goldfish crackers, but we also, um, we have a lot of kids that have food allergies. So we have food allergy lists that are in our classrooms and we do provide alternative snacks for them as well. And we provide a list of all the snacks that we provide and the allergies that go along with it. at the very end so <laughs> yeah but they have an expectation that snack is happening so we just put the expectation that like we have bible lesson and worship first and so that comes at the end of our service <laughs> yeah
that's a good question. So a question about our, our onboarding is uh, what do we do when somebody comes to us and says they want to be involved, and then how often do we get together all as a big group and celebrate? Um, good question. Uh, so what we typically do is um, if somebody hears about us, uh, word of mouth they come to us, or if someone takes our Be Radiant class, uh, typically happen every other month or so, um, we are one of the areas where they can they can come and serve, so we get their information down. And so we first uh, schedule usually a pastoral follow-up interview where we actually meet with them, you know, either in person or over Zoom or something for about a half hour, just get to know some of their background, you know, why are you interested in serving in kids, um, you know, just some, some questions like that to get to know them. And then we send them our, our kids team application, and that has a waiver with it that we can run a background check. Uh, it has a, um, also a link for that Protect My Ministry um, uh, online training and uh, references as well. So we get that back. Sometimes it, it takes a while. You know, people don't like to check their emails sometimes. Uh, but we do a background check. We, uh, we get their references. Um, and then we schedule a uh, orientation class in person uh, before our Saturday night service. So our service is at 6. And so we, we have everybody come usually at 4 o'clock. We come into one of our classrooms and uh, give kind of a presentation about some of the nuts and bolts, you know, our policies, procedures, but also some of our vision, you know, what we're about and where we're going. And then we do a, a tour of, of the area and show them, you know, here's uh, for a kid who might have a food allergy, you know, here's how, how we have with an EpiPen or uh, we have uh, safety locks um, on our doors, how to use those, you know, radios, just some of those procedures. Um, and then we have them observe in a classroom that night. So go to the class, you know, have dinner and then observe in a classroom where they're able to ask questions to, to the leader and um, not interact with any of the kids, but just to kind of observe uh, what's going on. And uh, then we follow up with them after that. Hey, how was your experience? What did you think? What did you like, didn't like? Uh, and then from there, we either let them observe in a different age group or uh, can uh, let them plug into a team because they've been background checked, they have their references, they've uh, been observed by us in person, you know, at least a couple times and in their, their classroom. Um, and then uh, if they still want to go for it, then we plug them into our, our uh, serving rotation from there. Yeah, so it, it is kind of a long process. Yes. Um, yes, and then uh, as the second part of that question, um, how often do we celebrate wins? Um, we, it sounds like in the past, we have done about two a year. Um, and so that was before I stepped on personally. Um, uh, actually, would you, so I'll share what we're kind of doing this year. Um, is in about a month, at the end of May, uh, we are doing one with our with both campuses, Portage and Richland, together. And uh, we are um, getting some new kids' t-shirts made. We're getting some really good food catered. We're going to just uh, really celebrate right here in, in the Richland uh, um, lobby, actually, and um, have one of our uh, pastors, Pastor Tim Matthews, who is actually acting as the MC for the conference, come and speak. And he's got two kids in kids' ministry, and he's... Um, I just want them to be inspired, to feel uh, appreciated, to feel cared for, celebrate our wins. So after uh, COVID, we're trying to feel it out. You know, something good in person uh, sounds like it'll be one this year. Um, and at, I think at least a baseline of one. But um, I'm interested, um, how did it feel when we were doing two or, or more kind of pre-COVID? So pre-COVID, we did... Um two big events for our kids team. So we rented out um, Airway Lanes, which was an entire facility, and we did a family focused, um, because not only are the volunteers kind of sacrificing their time, but so are their families. So we really wanted to pour into their entire family. So we did a family focused piece where we rented out the entire Airway Lanes. Families came and just um, had a really good time together. We did have breakout sessions in there as well, where they could sign up to go to a couple of classes. We asked that they attended at least one of the classes. So the kids were pretty much with their spouse while they attended one of the events. Um, they weren't super long or time consuming, but we wanted them, them to feel like they were getting something out of it more than just an event that would draw them there. Um, and then the other one we did, we rented um, space at Galmetto Farms, and we did that just for our volunteers, um, not so much 
the entire family for that one. And it was really, we didn't do any teaching for that. It was just a time for them to come and enjoy the space, enjoy having time with other volunteers that they've connected with, meeting people across other campuses. Um, so really just times that are fun has been our biggest thing for connecting with them. Yeah, and I, um, I, I, we will answer your question. I did just get um, the word that we're wrapping up in the next minute or so here uh, for the online session. Um, just join me in prayer briefly, and if you have any more questions, you know, we're here to answer them. Uh, dear Lord Jesus, uh, Father God, Holy Spirit, we thank you so much for what you are doing in kids' ministry. God, you care about the local church, but even more, you care about these kids. You care about the family. And so I just uh, pray a, a blessing over every single person here in this room, every single person watching online, that you would give them a special grace, that you would uh, invade their churches with your Holy Spirit, that they would uh, incorporate maybe some of these things and, and be encouraged today um, uh, to, to challenge these kids to, to be touched by the Holy Spirit and to have their lives changed for a moment. Uh, we thank you that you have, uh, you really have anointed each person in this room, and uh, we give you glory for it. And God, we want to stand back and watch uh, where you are going and see uh, what you do. We want to ride uh, the wave of the Spirit, God. We give you glory. We thank you for this time in the name of Jesus. Amen.